So we've talked about plutons, and oftentimes over the top of a pluton, you'll have volcanic eruption. Um, this photograph, the, the lead one here for volcanoes, is an area on the south coast of the big island of Hawaii, in the state of Hawaii. And it's actually a an area they call it the poly, and the poly means it's a cliff, and so it uh, Lava flows over the cliff, and then there's another cliff right down next to the ocean here. And so here you can see, well, uh, lavas that are pouring off of this, this cliff that are roughly about 1,400 degrees. Maybe, you know, when it's beginning to cool, it can get down to about 1,200 degrees. I think it's even hotter than that, actually, uh, out of Kilauea. I think it's pretty close to like 2,100 degrees when it first starts its journey towards the, the oceans, essentially. And so here... You can see where some of the past rock has cooled on the on the edge of this uh, this cliff, and then you can see where it's being quenched right at the water surface there. And so you can actually see the steam rising off, and immediately quenching that rock. So um, it's a very dangerous place, uh, but you know this, by all volcanic standards, is pretty much the easiest volcanic eruption you can have. And so uh, in this case, uh, it's called a Hawaiian-style eruption. We're going to get into eruption styles. We're going to talk about a volcano explosive index. And then we're also going to talk about the different types of volcanoes. And, and it, the types of volcanoes are actually very closely related to the kinds of rocks that are associated with the pluton. And so we'll get into this in a little bit more detail. If we just looked at a map across the uh, the North America and the United States and Canada and Mexico and, and so forth, you'd see there's volcanics all across the West. And so we call that area the Cordillera, remember? So all the way from Alaska into Central America there. And there are some active volcanoes in Mexico, for instance, in the Western United States, obviously, too. Uh, and, and in fact, what you see in this that you may not have recognized, there's even some in Missouri here, which very hard to detect on here, but those are ancient ones. Those are ones that would date back, you know, 1.4 billion years old. And if you look on the East coast, those are some that are dating back about 230 or 250, uh, million years ago when North America split apart from the rest of the world, essentially, and the Atlantic Ocean began to form after that. So these, those belong to what we call a rift uh, succession there. And they're volcanics. Uh, so there's also volcanics, as you can see here, in the Canadian Shield area as well, all of that area around Hudson Bay in the far north of Canada here. Um, so, okay, with that in mind, some of the highest mountain peaks in North America are volcanic. And so not all of them, but some of them are. And uh, so in the West, we have the the uh, Cascade Range. And the Cascade Range has mountains up to over 14,000 feet high. So for instance, uh, Mount Rainier is one of the larger, um, well, we call them stratovolcanoes or, or uh, uh, composite cone volcanoes. And so we'll get into that sort of detail later, but it's a huge mountain out near uh, Tacoma, Washington. Uh, if you wanted to find volcanoes even higher than that, you'd go to Mexico. And so in Mexico, there are volcanoes that are up around 17, almost 18,000 feet high. Uh, so not the highest mountains in North America. That would be Denali, and that's in Alaska, but that's, you know, that's an uplifted mountain range. They're a fault-bounded uh, mountain but these volcanoes can be pretty high. And so, and they, because they're volcanoes, they can erupt. And so this is where you find volcanic rocks. Okay. So all of this area that's kind of pinkish or, or, or orangish here, you can see where, where the volcanics are in North America. If we go around the world and look for just the active ones, the ones that have been inactive and in historic times, there's only about 1,500 volcanoes on Earth. Now, this is a test question. So you're going to, maybe even a quiz question, okay, for later this week. So how many volcanoes are there? Well, there's 1,500 roughly that are active or recently dormant, okay? So there are sleeping volcanoes. And so um, in the western part of the United States, you can see Mount St. Helens uh, noted there. And then also up in Alaska, uh, the Aleutian Peninsula, and, and also the Aleutian Islands that stretch out from that peninsula, all very active sort of volcanoes in that area. All through Japan, all through the Marianas Islands here, 
the Tonga Arch, all the way into the North Island of New Zealand. And then, of course, there is the volcanoes that are in uh, Indonesia, and one of those has recently erupted here as well, uh, through the Philippines. South America has volcanoes as well, and so we get the Altiplano volcanoes on the west coast. And then over in Africa, there's a whole series of volcanoes also that stretch down what we call the East Africa Rift Zone or the East Africa Rift Valley. And those get up pretty high, some of them there too. So Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya, over 17,000 feet high. And even in Europe, there's a few, right? So in Europe, we have Mount Vesuvius, Mount Etna on Sicily. Uh, there's some in the, in the uh, Southeast Asia as well, even in uh, the Arabian Peninsula, okay? So there's, they're all over the place uh, in the world. But there is a pattern to it. You can see that here. And so, for instance, all around the Pacific Ocean, you can see a series of volcanoes. <clears throat> we call that the Ring of Fire. So the Ring of Fire describes that sort of distribution around the Pacific Rim. And so that, that is called the Ring of Fire. Now, these other ones have different settings, however. And so if you go to, like, Iceland, for instance, you can see Leki and Hekla, and you can also see Surtsey here. Those are related to another type of process going on. So around the Pacific, most of the volcanoes there, and in Indonesia as well, that's all related to what we call subduction. That's where an ocean slab or an ocean plate is being subducted under perhaps another ocean plate, but then also perhaps a continental plate. And so we're going we're gonna to look at that sort of thing later when we talk about plate tectonics, but for now, just know that there's subduction going on. So I'll show you a, an image of what subduction really means. Some of these, however, are related to the pulling apart of plates. And so that's what's happening, for instance, in Iceland. And actually, there's new crustal material being added to the Atlantic Ocean. If North America was, was once part of all of these other combined continents, uh, we've broken apart from that in the last 200 and some million years here. That's the sort of process that's working in uh, East Africa as well. So in East Africa, that rift zone is where the earth is being rended apart. And so it's trying to make a new ocean, essentially, in East Africa. And it's going to separate East Africa from the rest of Africa there. Um, that's the, the distribution. So the number again, 1500. Okay. <laughs> so if you see, you know, and you're asked, how many active volcanoes or recently dormant volcanoes are there? Well, there's 1500 or 1500 volcanoes that are active on Earth. There's a lot of older ones than that that are no longer active, however. So the places where you get volcanoes, and we'll get into this in more detail when we talk about plate tectonics, but for now, when you pull plates apart or when plates go in opposite directions, that's called a divergent plate boundary. And so divergent plate boundaries are one of those zones. East Africa is called a rift zone. And so that's an example of where you get divergent plate boundaries. East Africa heading to the east and the rest of Africa heading to the west. And that rift zone opening up, it goes all the way from the Red Sea all the way down into Zimbabwe. Um... Spreading centers are another place. And so spreading centers are similar in origin, but that's actually occurring within the oceans themselves. Okay, so um, as, you, as you pull apart these things, they, they rift on the opposite. You know, if, they're, if you're pulling things apart, they're going to be subducted on the opposite side very commonly, or they just spread apart. And so that's the Atlantic is doing both of those, in fact. So uh, Europe and North America are, are drifting apart from one another at that center, in the center of the uh, Atlantic. They call it the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and that's where new crustal material is being added in a spreading center. And a spreading center, again, is where you get new crustal material added to an ocean floor. Um, and convergent plate boundaries, we're talking about where subduction occurs. And that's where you either have an ocean and an ocean plate collide, or a continent and an ocean plate collide. And, uh, and that's uh, subduction takes place there. And so usually it's the continental plate over the ocean plate. And with ocean, ocean, it could be either one of those plates that gets subducted when they collide. That's a convergent plate boundary. So convergent means they're coming together. Divergent means they're heading apart. Uh, for other settings, there are a handful of other settings. And so some of those are where we have what we call hot spots. 
We think that there's warm crustal material that makes its way all the way from the core mantle boundary, gets superheated, and it rises up to just below the the plates. And so the, the plates are composed of two parts. They have a little bit of subcrustal upper mantle there, and then there's also the crust. And so the crust and the mantle, the uppermost part of the mantle together, that is the plate. And that plate has material that's being underneath of it that's heating it up and causes a volcano to erupt there. That's what's going on, at least as best we understand it, in Hawaii and then also in Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. So it can happen underneath of a continent or it can happen underneath of ocean crust. And so in Hawaii, it's, you know, it's the, it's the ocean that's being heated up by a hot spot there. Uh, a lot of people think that actually Iceland too, even though it's on a spreading center, it has, has a hot spot underneath of it that's heating things up there. And that's why you get such active volcanism going on there as well. In the continental hotspot, you're talking about Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is this other area where it's kind of unpredictable. You know, it's like, well, okay, it has erupted in the past. It hasn't erupted recently, but there's all these geysers and hot springs and all this uh, geothermal activity, right? So heating up underneath of that area heats up the groundwater. And so you get all this massive plumbing sort of like explosions and things like that. So the geysers are like doing their job. The volcano itself is huge there. It's like 25 kilometers across. Okay, so like, what's that? 15 miles across, right? So a 15 mile wide opening at the top of a volcano. Well, there's Yellowstone Lake in the middle of it there. So at some point that'll probably erupt again. We don't know when, you know, it's like, uh, it's been hundreds of thousands of years since it last erupted. So we don't expect it very, very soon. But then again, it could, it could erupt at any time. And it has migrated all across North America, the western part of North America, leaving behind a, a trail from where it has, like, you know, wandered. This, this, actually, the continent has drifted over that hot spot. And in fact, so it's, it's being heated up from below. So those are the, the main settings here. So divergent plate boundaries, convergent plate boundaries, and hotspots. Those are the three main areas where you get volcanoes. And divergent, you can break into two parts, rift zones and spreading centers. And for the subduction, we're talking about oceans and oceans colliding with one another, or we're talking about oceans and continents colliding with one another. And the hotspots, that can occur either in ocean crust or continental crust, period. And this is an image to show you that. So this shows you the ring of fire here around the Pacific, and you can see the plates being subducted entirely around the perimeter of the Pacific. In the East Coast, on the Atlantic side, there's a little bit of subduction going on on the Caribbean plate. So the Caribbean plate, if you went to the Lesser Antilles, there's subduction going on there. And of course, obviously, on the opposite side of the Caribbean plate, that's part of the, the Ring of Fire on the Pacific uh, side over there. And you can see some other volcanic sort of settings over here as well. So the East Africa Rift Zone is shown up here down on the lower right-hand side. Uh, the Hawaii Hotspot is shown on the lower left-hand side. The Andes Mountains, where South America is overriding the Nazca Plate there, it's you've got volcanoes there as well. And the, the high, they call them the Altiplano. It's a very high plain, if you will. And it is loaded with volcanoes, massive volcanoes. And so 20,000 feet, some of the, the elevations on those. Um, in the Aleutian Islands, you can see an ocean plate overriding another ocean plate there. So that's up in the, uh, the upper left-hand side. Uh, Yellowstone hotspot there is shown on the North American plate here in the middle of a plate in this situation. That's why they're unusual, right? So Hawaii and Yellowstone are in the middle of a plate, and that's why they call it intraplate uh, settings for those. And those intraplate settings means that it's within a plate and you get volcanism there as well. And of course, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, of course, new crustal material being added there as well. And again, there may be a hot spot, in fact, right at Iceland, but in fact, the entire ridge has still got volcanic activity underneath of it in sort of a rift zone, actually. They call those rift zones sometimes as well. Usually, we reserve the term rift zone for the continental sort of volcanic setting uh, where the plates are being, diver being divergent. Um, so... Those are the settings. And so where do you not get volcanoes? That's a good question. It's like, so if that's a distribution and it's not random, in fact, there's, there's an explanation for why we get all these volcanoes. Where are they not occurring? 
Well, they're mostly not found in continent-continent collisions, and that can happen too. So that's like in the Himalayas. Now, there are a few rare volcanoes in the Himalayas, but they're not very effusive. They don't produce a lot of material. They don't have massive eruptions, and you don't hear about entire regions or towns being wiped out by volcanoes there. Uh, so that's like in the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. That's a place where there's a continental collision going on. So east, the, um, the Indian subcontinent has collided with the rest of Asia, and it's buckled that region. And they do refer to that actually as subduction as well, but it's it's a type of subduction called type 2 subduction. And so type 1 subduction is where you have an ocean plate colliding with a continent or ocean and ocean plates colliding. Type 2 is two continents colliding. And so um, we'll talk about that more when we get to plate tectonics. But continent-continent collisions, not so much for volcanics. Transform plate boundaries is another setting. And so what's a transform plate boundary? Well, that is where the continents go side or the plates go side by side. And if they go side by side, they're just slipping by one another and you don't have subduction being a driving force and allowing one of the plates to be um, essentially recycled as volcanic material. And so a transform plate boundary, a good explanation for that is in California. Now, you guys are familiar with the Sierra Nevadas, and the Sierra Nevada is formed from subduction. But then about 17 million years ago, that boundary became a transform plate boundary and the San Andreas Fault began its activity about that time. And so no longer is there subduction off the coast of California. And in fact, instead, there's just a translation of the Pacific plate on the west side and the North American plate on the east side sliding by one another. And so that's a transform plate boundary. We're going to talk about that more uh, when we get to plate tectonics as well. And then lastly, static. Static means that it's just stuck together where the plates don't interact with one another, but they don't seem to have any subduction going on and maybe not so much even a strike-slip sort of setting or or a transform sort of boundary there either. So that's what static refers to. So it just stays the same. Um, for this aspect... <laughs> And this is going to describe a little bit about why we get certain rocks in different places or how, what that plate activity is like. Recall, if you will, when we talked earlier about the densities of the various chemical compositions in igneous rocks, we said that continental crust is roughly 2.7 grams per cc. Ocean crust is roughly 3 grams per cc, and so when you collide them together, the heavier one is going to take the dive, and that explains subduction in some ways. And then also, we talk about the mantle, and the mantle is made out of that ultramafic material, which is about 3.3 grams per cc, and so the oceans and the continents can float on that where they're lighter than what the mantle is, and so they're going to be up at the top. But sometimes when you collide these things at the top, one of them is going to take a dive, and it's going to go into that denser material. And it, it, it gains heat when it's down there as well, and so eventually it's going to warm up that material. You're going to form magmas. Those magmas will rise up then and punch through the crustal material that's above, whether it's ocean crust or continental crust. And so that area that we talk about, these interactions where we have the plates resting on the mantle. We call that the lithosphere, okay? And I already made a hint at this already, but but the lithosphere is part crust, and then it's part the uppermost mantle. It's it, There's an oddity with this, because in the upper part of the mantle, there's a zone of partial melting on which it's a little bit slick, and so the plates can slide around on the outer surface of the earth. We're unique in that way, some people think that, you know, that Venus actually may have some plate tectonics going on. We know that Mars doesn't. We know that the moon doesn't. We know that the gaseous giants, there's no ways that, uh, that we can get down there to figure out exactly what's going on on the hard part of that, uh, the, those surfaces in there. So the gases are surrounding. We don't know what's going on down there. But we know that in Mars and the moon that we don't have plate tectonics. There's possibility of plate tectonics on Venus. And certainly we get it on Earth. And so there's this, you know, it's a dynamic sort of thing, right? So, you know, we heat crustal material up, and if you heat it up, you're going to form a magma. Um, or if you release the pressure, right? So if you release pressure, you form magmas as well. So the tectonic plates are, are also called lithospheric plates or simply plates. 
And uh, they can either be ocean crust or they can be continental crust. And that's sitting on top of what we call subcrustal upper mantle. And together those two form what we call the lithosphere. So the lithosphere, the rock realm, if you will, crustal, subcrustal upper mantle, and then below that is on a partial melting. So the plates slide around within the mantle. Okay, so within that upper part of the mantle. Um, below that zone of partial melting, so if there's a zone of partial melting in between the subcrustal upper mantle and the upper part of the mantle, that's called the asthenosphere. And so the asthenosphere is the rock that's down below that, and it's even heavier than what the subcrustal upper mantle is. So it can get up to like six grams per cc. That's pretty much far down in the mantle when we talk about that. So that explains a lot of the interactions why the plates behave like they do. Uh, so there's that zone of partial melting where we get some of the uh, magmas generated there. <clears throat> so if we look at a cross section here, it's not to scale. In other words, they're telling you that the layers are not, you know, on the right hand side here, those layers aren't that thick. And of course, we can't take a butter knife and cut through the earth to see what it looks like on the inside. But just imagine, if you will, if you had a globe and if you had a globe that was coated with varnish. That's about how thick the crust is on the outside of the earth, about like a layer of varnish on the outside, probably just about as thick as the paper covering that globe. And then below that, there's subcrustal upper mantle that goes a little bit deeper, but not real deep, okay? Just a few millimeters deeper in there. And then below that, it's mostly mantle. And most of the earth, as it turns out, it's made out of rock and it's made out of mantle material. That's about 75% of the earth. In the very core, there's some metal, okay? So that's the iron and nickel core. And the middle part is actually solid. It's been crystallized in the middle part under enormous amounts of pressure. But outside of that, there's an outer core, and that outer core is actually molten material. So it's molten nickel and iron, and that's what heats up the base of the mantle that drives some of these things like the hot spots. And so that is a cross-section of what Earth looks like. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we get to how do we know what's down there. And so, well, that's a long story. And so it's going to take another sort of episode to give you that sort of information. But for now, just know that the crustal material is relatively thin. And even on the outside of that, there's this sediment stuff that's out here. So the sedimentary rock and the sediments themselves are just a thin veneer on the outside of the crust. And so they call them, sometimes they call them super crustal rocks. And so that's what they're really meaning is sedimentary rocks that are on the outside of the crust. And so for continental crust itself, however, it can be up to like 70 kilometers thick. Um, when it talks, when you talk about ocean crust, it's mostly zero. At some places, there's actually mantle exposed in the deep oceans. A few places, not very many. But there, you know, there's just a thin sediment layer over the top of what's mantle material in a few places, like around Greenland, so a little bit around the Canary Islands and places like that. There's actually mantle material exposed very near the surface below a thin layer of sedimentary uh, rock or sediments. And so um, the oceans, by comparison to the continents, so if the continents are 70 kilometers thick, the oceans are only 10 kilometers thick. If you look at that subcrustal upper mantle, we're talking about another 200 kilometers on top of that, okay? So relatively thick for that subcrustal upper mantle part here. And that's going to have a composition similar to olivine, okay? So, um, but so that the, the continental crust and the ocean crust, relatively thin. The ocean crust much thicker, in fact, than what the, uh, the ocean, what the ocean crust much thinner than what the continental crust is. I'll show you a map of that here in a second. Oceanic volcanoes tend to be made out of basalt. The ocean crust tends to be made out of basaltic material or mafic material, whereas the continental volcanoes can either be intermediate or they can be felsic. If they're felsic, they're really dangerous. If they're intermediate, they can be dangerous as well. Uh, so um, the, the felsic and intermediate magmas form the complex three-dimensional minerals that tend to block up the the openings for volcanoes. And so when they get blocked, it builds up a lot of pressure and then they explode. And so those are the explosive volcanoes, the intermediate and the, and the felsic rocks, whereas the, the, the basaltic or the mafic rocks, let's say, they're going to be basalt when it erupts, right? So when that mafic material gets extruded down on the earth's surface, like it, like at Hawaii, 
it flows. It just flows easy because, again, those are made out of single chains and and very, very, um, there's not much to block up <laughs> those volcanoes. And so they're, they tend to be hot and, and because they form at the highest temperature and they tend to flow very easily. And so that's what you get with um, oceanic sort of like uh, volcanoes. But if you're on the continental crust, look out. Those are the areas where they can be very uh, explosive. So we're going to look at this in, in a little bit more detail. We're going to do a tour of volcanoes later on. Here, for instance, is a map that shows you the crustal thickness. Um, actually, it's just the crust now, so it's not the entire lithosphere. It'd be much more difficult to, to show you a map of the entire lithosphere because it varies substantially, too, uh, because it's a very complex sort of layer, that subcrustal upper mantle, and we don't have access to it, right? So it's not easy to get down there to see it. So in this case, we're just showing you the crustal material. So on the continents, of course, that's going to be felsic material for the most part. And then in the oceans, that's going to be basaltic material here. And so you can see where it's 10 kilometers thick, that outlines the oceans pretty much. So relatively thin. Oh, 10 kilometers, what is that? Eight miles, right? So eight miles is nothing, you know, for the diameter of the Earth. The, the Earth is 8,000 miles across, okay? Uh, it's about 25,000 miles around, and so are 40,000 kilometers around, right? So an 8,000 miles in diameter, that means that you'd have to go 4,000 miles directly down <laughs> in order to get to the center of the Earth, and so that's not going to happen um, any time soon anyway. <laughs> uh, with this, you can see where the thickest um, continental crust is. You can see the Himalayas. And again, that's where we have two continents colliding there, forming the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau. Um, it's pretty high, you know, thick crustal material also in the Cordillera, you can see here, and actually in the Andes as well. So it's up to 60 kilometers thick there, 30 kilometers in the Cordillera there. Where Missouri is, we're roughly about 40-some kilometers uh, thick here. And so we're talking about you know, relatively thick crust underneath of um, Missouri in this area, in the mid-continent region of North America. Um, anyway, that's it'll help explain why certain areas are more prone to having different kinds of volcanoes, right? And so here, uh, if we generate those magmas down at the Coromandel boundary, let's say we have a hot spot. Well, this tells you why hot spots will actually form. And again, we're talking in this case about Hawaii. We're talking about places like uh, Iceland. We're talking about Yellowstone. And so in this case, they're showing you ocean crust at the top. So it's more like Hawaii in this case. And they, they, they show you material being heated up because the, the bottom of the mantle is resting on molten metal. <laughs> From molten metal, it's going to heat that rock up. It's going to melt that rock. And what you get over that rock, in fact, is what they call a plume. And a plume will rise up through the mantle. It'll, it'll puncture right through the mantle. And then it pulls up once it gets below the, the lithosphere. And so the lithosphere, when it gets to that subcrustal upper mantle, begins to heat it up. And so you form your magmas and magma chambers there. And so then you can form volcanoes after that. And so once you got a magma chamber, your volcano comes next. And in this case, they're actually showing you where a volcanic chain has originated. And it's much like the Hawaiian Islands. Um, so that gives you an explanation of the dynamics of Earth, a little bit of a foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about when we talk about tectonics. And uh, so now let's talk about the various kinds of volcanoes that we recognize. And so those volcanoes are based on the shape, based on the size, and based on the material. What kind of volcanoes do we have? So for instance, in the Hawaiian Islands, that's called a shield volcano. Now, a shield volcano is named for the sort of structure that you would put. Like if you were a warrior, you would put a shield on, you know, to, to fend off arrows or, or sword attacks and things like that, right? So that shield is shaped like that. So it's low. And it's relatively flat, but it has this sort of arching sort of shape. And so that's what shield volcanoes are. In other words, they're kind of low uh, profile as far as their elevation, but they can be relatively high mountains as well. But remember, but it's because they're so broad, okay? So for instance, the, the big island of Hawaii, 
is enormously big, <laughs> resting on seafloor. In fact, it weighs so much that there's a, a trough around the big island Hawaii because the island is sitting there weighing down on that crustal material. But in fact, it has a low, broad shape. So if you're talking about 50, well, if it was a 56,000 feet, that's what it is, 10, 10 miles high. So if it's 10 miles high, sitting on top of ocean crust, which is six miles high, so six miles of crust and, and eight miles of, of, um, crust of uh, volcanic material sitting on top of that, it pushes it down a little bit. But the whole thing, that whole island is like 300 miles across, right? And so if it's 300 miles across, that spreads it out a lot. And so that's that shape. It's a shield sort of shape. And so there's several shield volcanoes around the world, but they're not the most common variety. And so with this, with shield volcanoes, they have that sort of profile because the lavas tend to flow across that landscape. And so remember, when it comes to like the composition of those lavas, they tend to be mafic and mafic rocks will flow very easily. And so that's a shield volcano. Composite cone volcanoes. Sometimes you get these, uh, um, well, you get these mostly at subduction zones. And so like in the, uh, well, it's the Andes mountains, it's the Cascade mountains, it's in Alaska and the, uh, in, in the uh, in places along the Aleutian uh, arc there, and in Japan, in places like that, right? So those are the composite cones. In fact, they're made out of flows as well as volcanic ash. The ash is a much more explosive product that comes out of volcanoes, and so composite cone tells us what it's made out of, and so it's a combination of volcanic eruptive material and then flows also. Composite cone is what we use to describe that sort of composition, if you will. So the, the composition, not chemical composition or mineral composition in this case, but the actual flow composition, flows and eruptive material. The other term for that is called stratovolcano because stratovolcano means it's just a high volcano, but it tends to be more isolated in size than what the shield volcanoes are. They tend to be very steep on the sides, so they don't spread out as much because the lavas aren't flowing as easily as what they do in shield volcanoes. And so with stratovolcanoes, they're very steep and they tend to have intermediate and felsic composition. So they're very dangerous. What that does, again, it blocks up the opening to that volcano. When it erupts, it is very explosive and you get a mess out of that. Um, cinder cone volcanoes, sometimes they're called parasitic cones. They tend to be very small and they tend to be on other volcanoes. So you can think about uh, uh, cinder cone volcanoes as just like little tiny cones uh, like an ice cream cone on a sidewalk, if you will. Uh, they'll be near the ice cream truck if the ice cream truck is the main volcano. So then you get the little volcanoes all around that. And so those are called cinder cones. We'll take a look at some of those. We'll look at some pictures of those. Flood basalts and traps uh, is another word. Now, trap is actually a Swedish word. It's actually the Swedish word trappa. And so traps are where there's a huge outflowing of lava but there's really not one major volcano that's associated with it. It's just a crack that opens up in the ground and the lava flows out layer after layer after layer. And so trapa actually means steps. And so you can go up a series of layers in these volcanoes. Very commonly, they'll become eroded and leave canyons behind. And so if you look at the hillsides that are associated with traps, and there's a couple of famous ones around the world where there were huge outpourings of lava and in those outpourings of lava, you could see layer after layer after layer had been uh, deposited there, if you will, or, or had flowed across that surface and cooled there. Uh, so those are traps. Mars, M-A-A-R-S, not the planet Mars, but in fact, this is a type of volcanic crater. And it's actually a, a crater that's a, a crater that's associated with a steam eruption. So when you get a mixture of, of magma and groundwater, it makes for a very explosive sort of combination. So the steam very rapidly will expand and cause an explosion crater. And so that's what you get with a mar. They're called phreatic eruptions. Phreatic meaning it's water that's in the subsurface that's below the water table. And so when you're right near the, the water table, these have 
a tendency to make craters that will just explode like that. Kilauea uh, caldera actually is a result of that sort of phreatic sort of expression, if you will. So it, it left behind a huge crater because of that. And it's a crater that today is filling up with lava again. But it could become dangerous again if it begins to recede, okay? So we look at these eruptions as being episodic, if you will. They, they tend to fill up that crater, and when it begins to drain back into a magma chamber there, it's more likely to interact with the groundwater coming in, and then next thing you know, kaboom, the whole thing can blow up. Um, and so they can be dangerous a little bit. So that's the one exception for shield volcanoes. Shield volcanoes can, can sometimes have phreatic eruptions associated with them. Not the most common sort of event. Not as common, for instance, as the stratovolcanoes blowing up, but, uh, but they can do that. And so a uh, rift eruption. A rift eruption can occur where there's not a single volcanic uh, vent. You know, volcanoes tend to be very localized and kind of round if you look down from above, like from satellite or, or from uh, airplane imagery. But in this case, a rift eruption will be along a crack or a fracture in the earth. And so that is where material begins to flow out. And maybe you form fountains and other sorts of, uh, sorts of features there. They're volcanic eruptive features, but, uh, but not exactly like a trap. A trap is where it's much larger in scale and it tends to just flow out of that sort of like late major crack in that uh, situation. We'll take a look at a rift eruption here from Hawaii as an example. And then lastly, a caldera. A caldera is like a really large uh, mar, if you will. So if, uh, and they're, they're not always associated with phreatic eruptions. In fact, calderas may be where you withdraw your magma back into that magma chamber, and that magma chamber then withdraws. And so it tends to be enormously violent. And so we haven't really witnessed a caldera collapse in recent history on Earth. And so, in fact, uh, it has happened in, in the time span of humanity. I will say that. About 1,500 years ago, there was a massive eruption on the North Island of, of uh, New Zealand, at Mount Taupo. But there was nobody living there to actually see it when it happened. There was another uh, caldera collapse in Western North America at a place today we, we know it as, uh, as Crater Lake, that crater formed and then filled with lake water afterwards when the caldera collapsed. And there were Native Americans that lived around that area and survived that eruption. Um, not all of them did, I'm pretty sure. So when that caldera collapsed at Crater Lake, um, it left a layer of ash three meters thick in some places around the vicinity of Crater Lake. Um, so, and they find things underneath of that layer. And so they find artifacts and they find, for instance, they'll find, uh, sandals. And so there were woven sandals made out of, uh, sagebrush, I think it was. And so those sagebrush sandals were left behind underneath of the volcanic material. Uh, pretty scary situation, right? So, um, so volcanoes are inherently dangerous. <laughs> you probably knew that already. I'm here to express that. Okay. So if you live around a volcano, be careful. Okay. Uh, know that there, there are ways to actually to predict volcanic eruptions. At least we're much better at predicting volcanic eruptions than we are earthquakes. Okay. So, uh, that's a that's a very good thing, right? And that's why it's important to do science. And that's why it's important to have earth science, in, in especially. So eventually we may get good enough to predict earthquakes as well. We're only being able to do that on a sort of like probabilistic scale right now. Okay, so if we try to relate the volcanoes to the types of magma, they're going to be associated with either felsic or mafic. We'll just include intermediate when with the felsic here when we talk about it. But the mafic composition ones, they tend to flow. The ones that are felsic and intermediate, they tend to erupt violently. And so we'll get to that. And uh, so if we just look at a cross-section of what it looks like, the difference between a shield volcano and a, a stratocone volcano, here you can see a comparison of Mauna Loa, that's the main volcano on the Big Island of Hawaii. It's the active one. It's 13,900, 800 some feet high. 
massive sort of volcano, but it, it spreads out way across. And so Kilauea is on the flanks of Mauna Loa, that caldera. It's on the flanks of Mauna Loa. By comparison, if they were both, like if you set Mauna Loa on the seafloor and you put Mount Rainier and compared it to it, it's about less than half the size vertically and less than a tenth of the size horizontally. And so that's what you see here. So if Kilauea is 120 miles across, I said 300, it's 120 miles across. Uh, if you compare that to, um, well, to Mount Rainier here, it's only like 10 miles across. And so uh, stratovolcanoes are down here at the bottom, and you can actually see what they look like. Uh, they're very sharp. They're pointed. Um, in the old days, there used to be a soda called uh, Shasta. And so Shasta is a type of stratovolcano. It's in northern California. It has that classic sort of mountain shape that most children draw, right? So it's like it goes up, and then it goes back down, right? And so that's a stratovolcano from the Philippines here. That's called Mayon. And it's a composite cone, and composite cone and stratovolcano are like this, okay? Those are peaks like that. And then when you have their composition, if you were to slice into them, you would see that it's layers of uh, flows you know, interbedded with layers of volcanic eruptive material, like volcanic tuff, right? So the tuff would be interlayered with the volcanic flow material, which would be more like either a rhyolite or an andesite or something like that. Like if you were to have the source for the magma down below and the volcano above here, and it shows you what those eruptive clouds look like, and they, they are, they're ash and, and all, but then you can see a flow here interbedded with it. And that kind of, kind of explains the composition of composite cones. And so that is um, some of the products you get with these. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to apply names to some of these things as well. Uh, when you have that eruptive cloud over the top, uh, that's just an eruption, we call that. And you get this ash cloud essentially over the top. You can also get ash flows because rock is heavier than the air that it erupts into. And so very commonly, that column of, of ash and rock can't support itself under the pressure of, of being ejected out of that volcano. And they come back down and then they flatten out and then they surge around the perimeter of that volcano. That's called a basal surge. And that process, actually, that ash flow that's occurring with that is, no, is known as a nue ardente. And so we're going to spell that out for you later here. But that ash flow is a nue ardente. Sometimes if there's snow on a volcano, you melt the, the snow, turns to water. Water and volcanic ash makes mud, and you get mud flows that come out of these things as well. And those are known as lahars. And so lahars and nue ardentes are two types of eruptions that you get with stratocone volcanoes, uh, stratovolcanoes or composite cone volcanoes. Um, a lava dome is shown in, in this one as well. And that's very commonly a very slow extrusion of felsic material at the outside. It may be rising up at one or two centimeters per hour, but it's just very slowly being erupted. And you can't even tell it's erupting, I guess is what I would say. So for instance, on Mount St. Helens in Washington, the state of Washington, there is a rhyolitic dome that is slowly being pushed out of that volcano and it's very slow scale, but it makes it dangerous because it blocks up that volcano and it builds up pressure. Now, sometimes the lavas are much more um, able to flow. And so we like to say that they are less uh, viscous. And so being less viscous, it's more able to flow. Viscosity is the resistance to flow. And you can also get landslides, of course, with these as well. You get earthquakes so sometimes associated with volcanoes also. And uh, so the landslides will come down the sides of a mountain and form deposits as well. Um, so here is a cross-section of what it looks like for a stratocone, or a, st a stratovolcano or a composite cone volcano. Here's your shield volcano by comparison. And here you can see the lava flows where they've just very gently formed that sort of shield sort of structure with a volcano here. Um, for... These are the kind of classic ones here. For cinder cones, it's kind of like a, I don't know, I think they make like sparklers, sort of like fountains, I guess you call them, and 
Fourth uh, of July fireworks. And so you can see in that situation where that material is being uh, emitted from that volcanic vent. And so the vent is full of rock fragments and those rock fla uh, fragments fly out of that vent and, so, and it forms that sort of cone sh shape, but it's a very small shape compared to like a shield volcano. Very commonly stratocone volcanoes are made out of basalt as it turns out. And sometimes you can get late stage basalts, even in stratocone volcanoes, but composite cones in this situation take that last dregs of that magma chamber, flood it out across the landscape, and very commonly that could be basaltic. And so there's some great stories that go along with this as well. So um, in, in a little town in Mexico in the 1930s, there was a guy farming in the field around Percutin, and as he was farming, he noticed that the ground was getting warm, and as soon it began, there was a, fr a crack that opened up across his farm. It was a cornfield, and it began to have smoke coming out of it. And next thing you know, there's a few rock, and so it was big, rock fragments were coming out of it, and it began to form that volcano in the back back there. It grew to 1,400 feet within a few weeks, but then it stopped after a while. So that's, that's a cinder cone right there. And so they can happen like that, okay? Very, very rapidly. And in fact, this one actually had some other lavas that flowed out that were not so gentle as what these sort of like little cinder here, you know, like popping out like, we're going to know that as a Strombolian eruption, but the cinders are being um, plastered out of the, the volcano. Well, sometimes the flow <laughs> began then also out of that crack and the flow surrounded, in this case, the church here. So you can see the church with the steeple uh, hanging out above the flow that was around here as well. And so that's that's pretty scary, actually, <laughs> when you look at it. Um, that's, a, that's a cinder cone volcano there. Um, when we look at other volcanoes, one of the more famous ones, at least in Arizona, is Sunset Crater. And you can see that it has a sort of divot at the top that's summit uh, uh, crater, if you will. And that's why they call it a sunset crater, right? So it's, it's like it's out there on the western edge of where these craters are. And you can see that it has that sort of cone shape with a crater at the top. And that's a national monument. Now, the last time that that erupted was about to the north in a little uh, gully that ran through there. And that whole village, when that thing erupted, it began to fill in parts of that, you know, some of the some of the other eruptive materials landed in that village, and they had to evacuate the village. They've uncovered parts of that village, in fact, after that eruption went off. And so not all of the material in a cinder cone is right there at the cone itself, and so it can actually erupt a lot more material out of it. And you can see that Sunset Crater, in fact, is surrounded by all these other craters, in fact. Cinder cone after cinder cone after cinder cone. And then off to the left over here, on the left side of this digital elevation model, that's Humphreys Peak right there. Now that thing tends to be covered with snow. We're a little bit south of the Grand Canyon here, and that's a place right there where you can kind of see that there's kind of a horseshoe or kind of rectangular area in the middle of that peak, just, just to the north of, it, of Humphreys Peak there. That whole area there erupted laterally some tens of thousands of years ago, and so it blasted out a horseshoe right there when that erupted. And that was much like the eruption at Mount St. Helens back in 1980. And so 1980, Mount St. Helens surprised everybody by blasting out the side of the crater, by blasting out the side of the mountain. And it deposited material to the north and the east when it did that. And this one did the same sort of thing. And so people began to investigate other volcanoes after they understood what was happening at Mount St. Helens. It's a pretty cool area. Um, got to visit there a couple of years ago as well. So a fantastic sort of uh, setting here for volcanic uh, activity. So if we look at the types of volcanic activity as well, the, the types of eruptions kind of come back to where we see active volcanoes today. 
And so, for instance, a Hawaiian eruption would be that flow, just like you saw in the first photo in this presentation. A Hawaiian eruption, typically basaltic sort of flow and material that very gently, mildly flows across the landscape. You don't want to be too close to it, but it's still dangerous. But uh, a Strombolian, on the other hand, is more like a cinder cone eruption. Strombolian is where you get pyroclastic material blasted out of the volcano. It's named for the island of Stromboli, which is off the coast of Italy. And so it is a, a kind of a, an interesting island. So Stromboli is a, a volcano that sticks out of the Mediterranean Sea, and it's notorious for its landslides as well as its eruptive uh, capacity. The next variety of volcanic eruption, when we describe these things, we say, which ones do you have to worry about? Volcanian, you usually don't have to worry a whole lot about it, but it is a cloud, a large ash cloud that will flow, uh, flow, it will erupt in this uh, ash cloud above a volcano. And so Volcanian, you can very commonly see these are puffs of smoke over the top of a volcano. Now that is pretty scary. It can be kind of scary, but not as scary as the next one. So a Pelean eruption is named for, it's named for Mount Pele in the Caribbean. And that is the Nuit Ardente that we were talking about earlier. And so a Nuit Ardente is this sort of ash cloud, red hot with gas and ash. And that material flows from that cloud. It returns back to earth and then it could it can go like several hundred miles per hour, <laughs> like 200 miles per hour. Sometimes those gas clouds can like roll off of that volcano. And of course they wipe out everything in their path. And so when people live around volcanoes, they take their own life in their, their own hands. In South America, there were some Pelean eruptions not too long ago here that have wiped out villages. It happens in the Philippines as well. So Pelean eruptions are these new AR daunt clouds that will be eruptive from a volcano. Phreatic eruptions, I've already described that. That's where your magma mixes with groundwater and it causes a steam eruption and it blasts a hole in the rock. And so that's a phreatic eruption. These are all styles of eruptions now, not the type of rock that actually is formed there. We're not talking about like, you know, basalts or we're not talking about andesite and things like that. In fact, we're talking about just the style of eruption. So Plinian eruptions, okay, now we're getting into the ones that are really pretty scary. So Plinian is named for the, he was a historian and a, and a philosopher. His name was Pliny. And there was Pliny the Younger and Pliny the Elder. And I think it was Pliny the Elder who was involved with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius on Italy. And so Mount Vesuvius, when it blew up, it wiped out the city of Pompeii. It also wiped out the city of Herculaneum. Um, and that was a massive eruption. It took hundreds of years, thousands of years, 2,000 years roughly later that people began to excavate into Pompeii and they found the remains of that city. That's yeah, a very stark sort of uh, uh, setting for Pompeii. That was a plenty of eruption. Massive ash cloud, all sorts of rock falling over Pompeii. Um, and they, it, you know, it got so deeply buried, about 60 meters of rock over the top of it, but they eventually excavated down to where that ancient city was. There's another type that nobody's ever seen before. And we have the evidence for it in the rocks. And they call those superplenian or ultraplenian. They're absolutely massive eruptions that would have changed the atmosphere, would have changed the climate. They would have caused death and destruction. Um, and actually a superplenian eruption almost wiped out humanity as we know it about 60,000 years ago. And that massive eruption was in, it's a place called Mount Toba in Indonesia. Mount Toba today is filled with a lake, like Yellowstone is. And if Yellowstone ever blows up again, that could be something like a superplenian or ultraplenian uh, eruption. And so it's something to watch for uh, in the future. That's one way to view how volcanoes form and when they explode and so forth. Another way to do it is through the volume of material that's emitted. And so um, on this slide, it shows you the volcanic explosivity index. Uh, 
or VEI, they abbreviate it, and it goes from zero to seven down here. And seven is what Yellowstone did when it erupted some 600,000 years ago. And uh, But in fact, on the right-hand side, in that photograph, that's the explosion of Mount Pinatubo. Uh, and Mount Pinatubo occurred in 1991 here. And that's roughly 10 cubic kilometers of material that erupted from that mountain. And as crazy as this sounds, okay, so that's the that's a number six on the explosivity um, ranking there. So it's between a five and a six at 10 square kilometers. Okay, so I think that's actually considered a six there. And that volcanic eruption is actually one of the greatest successes for science as we know it um, because they were able to predict when that volcano was going to erupt within a day. In fact, they, they issued orders to evacuate everybody from the surrounding vicinity of Mount Pinatubo. Of course, not everybody left, but the ones that did leave survived. And so they said, it's going to blow. It's time to get out of here. And so people left. And when they left, it saved their lives. And so there were only, it sounds like a lot of people, but there were only a thousand people that died in that eruption so that is an, a success story for being able to predict volcanic eruptions. That was at Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, 1991. So a vol volcanic explosivity index is good for comparing volcanic eruptions one to another. So for instance, uh, I, I mentioned earlier the, uh, in, an, in another uh, episode on magmas, when we talked about Mono Lake and we talked about Long Valley Caldera and we talked about the Bishop Tuff, well, the Bishop Tuff would have been up there pretty high as well when it erupted. 1980, when it erupted, it was on television news. There were films that showed the eruption. Um, there's not too many of them. There's actually a time lapse of still photography that shows the eruption. There was a landslide, and when it blasted out laterally, it blasted out one cubic kilometer of material. So the whole top of the mountain was gone uh, during that eruption. And so um, it ranks a number four on the, uh, on the scale here. And so pretty, pretty amazing sort of uh, eruptive sort of capacities here. So um, here's an example for a Hawaiian eruption. So to go back to the previous concept, eruptive styles, there's a Hawaiian eruption right here. Here's a Strombolian eruption. So the Hawaiian eruption, you can just see it flowing. With the Strombolian eruption, you got all these pyrotechnics going on. So that's at the top of the island of Stromboli here. And you can see the arcs from all the hot rock fragments, magma fragments that are flying across the landscape here. Here's a, a photo of Stromboli when it's merely smoking and off the coast. And so you can see where the landslides occur uh, on that volcano as well. And so Stromboli, very active volcano off the coast of Italy here. Uh, currently, I think Etna is very active. So Mount Etna on Sicily is uh, erupting on a regular basis. It's about a 10,000 foot high mountain in Sicily. Uh, uh, Mount Etna is on Sicily. So here you can see what's going on there. There's actually subduction going on underneath of that area. And so part of the Mediterranean Sea on the Arabian plate is being subducted underneath of Italy here. And Italy itself is surrounded <laughs> by two subduction zones. There's a subduction zone on the west side of Italy and a subduction zone on the east side of Italy. And, um, and so you can see here where those volcanoes form. And so uh, there's volcanoes at Stromboli and Etna, and there's a few others around there as well. But that is the setting for Stromboli and uh, volcanism here again, with a subduction zone. Um, when we look at Pompeii, here are some images from, uh, well, these were much after the fact, right? So uh, what you see in the upper left-hand side, that's Pliny the Elder, who was killed in that eruption in AD 79. I think he was actually in a boat off the coast of Herculaneum when he was inundated by a cloud, a hot ash cloud that came out across the sea, hit the sea, and it spread out and pretty much, you know, everybody died uh, in that vicinity around, uh, around Pompeii, around the Mount Vesuvius. So 
When they began excavating Mount Vesuvius, they were digging through and finding some of the ancient buildings and everything, and every once in a while they'd hit a void. And they didn't know what they were hitting when they hit these voids. And it's like, and so they decided to pour plaster into some of these voids. And as it turns out, once the plaster had hardened and they excavated the rock around where that plaster had been put into that mold, uh, those were people. And so they find um, the remain. they don't find the remains of the people because the people were burnt up, essentially. And so as the dogs were, they find dog molds, essentially, where the volcanic material had surrounded what was living people. And so they preserve them in, in plaster. And so many of the victims of that volcanic eruption were preserved in plaster in the excavations. And so it was nice to be able to show people that they once existed. And here they are, and this is their last moments on Earth when they were trying to breathe and trying to escape that volcanic eruption. And we think that's maybe an isolated event. Well, that's not the case. That happened in AD 79, so, you know, almost 2,000 years ago. Um, in World War II, uh, Italy was uh, one of the Axis powers with Germany and Austria. And so they, uh, they would, the Allies were fighting them, of course, at this time. And that was another time when Mount Vesuvius erupted. So you can see this eruption in 1943 here out of the window of uh, an American bomber who's flying over some target that they've, they've recognized in the, uh, in the battlefield here. But that is Mount Vesuvius in 1943, showing it erupting and the planes flying nearby here. Um, what a scary place, right? You know, war scary, volcanoes are scary. Um, and other plenty of eruptions. Here's another plenty of eruption right here. So if that was the type example for a plenty of eruption, this is one that you can actually see. This is Mount Redoubt, and it was 1992 when it erupted, and it's, of course, where there's subduction going on of uh, the Pacific underneath of part of Alaska here. It's very close to the city of Anchorage, capital of Alaska. And so Mount Redoubt is on that Alaskan peninsula here, and uh, that extends on and continues on as part of the Aleutian Islands here. And so you can see where it's located over here, but that thing goes off on a regular basis, like about every five years or six years or so. Uh, but never quite so much as what it was in 1992 in recent time, although in 2018 there was eruption here as well. Uh, when that erupts, people in Anchorage have to pay attention because... Uh, it covers the entire city with volcanic ash, so you you have to watch how you breathe. You can't really go out and drive much because it's going to ruin your car with all the volcanic ash that gets sucked into the uh, air intake. But um, but it's uh, that's a plenty of eruption right here in 1992, and that's where we're going to end it for now. Uh, we've talked about. The types of eruptions, you know, Hawaiian, Strombolian, uh, Plinian, Ultra Pliny, all these different kinds of eruptions, Mars and phreatic eruptions and so forth. We talked about the different kinds of volcanoes as well. I'm going to take you on another tour, essentially, of volcanoes next, and you'll get to see these things up close and personal from around the world. And so it's kind of neat to be able to uh, view um, volcanoes from a distance. <laughs> um, I've been around some volcanoes, not too many of them, but some of them. And, uh, and so they're kind of neat. Yeah. I mean, if they're not erupting, that is. So that's a good thing when they're not erupting. Um, anyway, we'll do the grand tour of volcanoes next. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for your time.